Um, thank you for, for having me. Um, yeah, so um, I'm a group leader at Janilia. I've been there about seven years. Um, so Janilia is a um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute um, research campus, um, and uh, primarily we work on neuroscience, and in particular developing new technologies for, for neuroscience. So there's a lot of kind of microscope development, imaging development, um, uh, kind of genetic tool development, and um, we work on kind of the analysis of the types of data um, that um, are collected. Um, and so, um, the big problem that, that we're trying to understand is, you know, how, how the brain generates behavior, how it takes in sensory information, does a lot of processing, and produces behavior. Um, and at Genilia, um, kind of it's, you know, we're, we're focused on more of the kind of cutting edge technologies for trying to, to understand this. So there's a, a bunch of different types of big data that, that we collect to um, try to approach this problem. Um, so one of the types of data that, that's pretty popular at Genilia right now and, and, and elsewhere is um, calcium imaging. So this is an example, um, so this is a Drosophila larva, um, and it's um, being imaged using a, a light sheet microscope. Um, so the color here um, is indicating um, uh, the calcium sensor, which is a, a measure of the activity of the neurons. So they're able to do um, neural activity recording um, with cellular resolution in every single neuron in that, in that animal. Um, and um, they want to understand kind of how, how the behaviors, the locomotion behaviors, things like that, are generating that behavior. And of course, that's a, a large amount of data. It's a 3D volume, so they're collecting uh, data at the rate of about a terabyte an hour. Um, so you need you know, automated tools for, for analyzing that. Um, another one of the big projects that's um, going on at Genilia right now is um, trying to get um, a full connectome of a, of a fly brain. So they want to know at the synapse level the connectivity of every neuron to every other neuron in the fly brain. Um, so this is, um, they're doing this using electron microscopy um, imaging. Um, and so that's what this, is, this video is showing. Um, so the, um, kind of these are the structures of different neurons. Um, a lot of the kind of, so there's a lot of, you know, technology development on the microscope side, the staining side, but the kind of big bottleneck right now is on the computer vision side of actually tracing these neurons and figuring out which neurons are connected to which. Um, and again, that's another big data problem. It's about a 100 terabyte data set um, that they're using deep learning technologies for trying to automatically trace. Um, so we work on um, mostly uh, uh, maybe seemingly less high-tech um, type of data, but actually it ends up being a large data set as well. We try to um, look at the output of this system. So instead of trying to look at the, you know, the neural activity itself or the, um, the structure of the brain, we're trying to actually try to understand these things in the context of the behaviors that they're producing. Um, so this is a, a video of um, flies walking around in um, our fly bowl, um, which is just a dish, um, and we're um, using uh, computer vision t techniques to, to automatically annotate the behaviors of the animals. Um, and so that's, that's what my lab specializes in, is uh, quantitative analysis of, of animal behavior. Um, and there are two types of experiments that um, we do at Genilia that, that we use this type of um, technique for. Um, so the first is when we're doing um, neural activity recordings in a behaving animal. So this um, image here is showing um, an example of a, um, it's a fly that's um, walking on a kind of a treadmill. It's a, it's a, a, a ball that's kind of puffed up with air. Um, and you can um, record what the fly is walking, you know, what its direction of walking is based on the rotation of this ball. And then they have these kind of virtual reality screens that they show to the fly to um, make it think it's in a, you know, in a, in a real environment. Um, and while they're doing this, they can either do calcium imaging. Can you see that? No, you can't see my mouse. There you go. Um, they're either doing calcium imaging in this case or um, in, in other cases doing electrophysiology to kind of get um, uh, single neuron, very high resolution recordings, high temporal resolution recordings, and trying to put together the um, behavior with the um, neural recordings. Um, and the other type of um, technique or the type of experiment that, that we work on is um, using genetic techniques for neural manipulation, so optogenetics, thermogenetics in particular. Um, and so at Genelia, they've developed this collection of on the order of 10,000 different genotypes of flies um, where they can target um, expression to very specific subsets of neurons. So this um, right here is a, um, an image of a, of a fly brain. So the magenta is a, kind of a reference stain just to show us where the, where the brain is. And then these green, um, the green neurons here, or the green part here is showing which neurons we're actually targeting. So we can target expression of things like green fluorescent protein, which is what we're doing here, or we can target expression of an effector like um, a channel rhodopsin or a redshifted version of channel rhodopsin called crimson um, to try to activate those neurons with light. And so that's what um, this video is showing. 
Um, so this, um, this light in the top left corner that you see is showing when we're turning on the light to stimulate the, um, the neurons shown in green in that, in that image. And um, if you saw it, when that, that light turned on, it'll play again, um, all of the flies started walking backwards. And so one of our, our goals is to be able to kind of take all of these different patterns of neural um, expression of what, what neurons were activating and put it together with the behavioral effects that we observe in a quantitative um, way and try to understand um, what parts of the brain are involved in producing what behaviors. Um, so a big part of that for us is, is how do we actually quantify from video of the animals behaving what the behavioral effects um, are. Um, and so um, we often are collecting data in this pretty simple setup. It's just a, it's just a dish. Um, we put, um, in the experiments I'll show you, we put 10 male flies and 10 female flies into it. Um, and we want to be able to come up, go from this video to some kind of quantitative, low-dimensional description of the, of the behavior. Um, and so one of the questions that I spend a lot of my time thinking about is actually how we should represent animal behavior. Um, and, you know, a related question of what is a good representation of behavior. Um, so there's, you know, supervised machine learning techniques where we, we have a human go through and say, okay, these are the 15 different behaviors that I think flies do, and we can try to automatically detect those, or we can try unsupervised or weakly supervised or semi-supervised techniques um, to try to discover automatically what, the, what those behaviors are. To discover automatically, we need to have kind of a definition of what a good representation of, of behavior is. And then, yeah, there's the kind of computer vision problem of if we know this representation, how do we extract it um, from video? So um, uh, I've, you know, I, I did my PhD kind of in computer science and have kind of become more and more applied um, since then. So I try to, um, you know, I work in a neuroscience institute. Um, I work with engineers. I work with biologists. And I try to think about all of the components of the problem jointly to try to find the best solution. So we, we think about the experimental design and the data collection methods because the computer vision problem is a lot easier if you just collect beautiful video where your flies are black and your background is white. Um, we, we think about, um, you know, we of course know the, sorry, the different uh, machine vision and learning algorithms and what they, go ahead. So are you just in this plot or are you just interested in the language? In this, in this, in this part here, we're just, and in my lab in general, we've never looked at flying flies. So we only look at walking flies. And you would be surprised what fraction of the time flies spend walking, I think. Uh, so a lot of their kind of interesting behaviors are there. There are um, most, so getting flies to fly in a, um, kind of closed environment, you actually need a pretty big environment to have that happen. So the people at Genelia who work on flying flies do it in a tethered fly um, with a visual arena. Yes, oh sorry, yes we are. There's a, there's a ceiling to this dish which is three and a half millimeters from the ground. Um, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so yeah, so that's one of the experimental designs that we come up with that, you know, you don't want occlusions um, with the video, so it's nice to have kind of a very thin ceiling to um, keep the flies in a single layer. Um, and there's all kinds of, t you know, it's a bowl because it's, it, the, the flies are, um, are thigma, like to thigma attack, so they like to be at the bound at edges, so you don't really want to have too many edges in your dish, so there's kind of a lot of things we, we think about. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's a compromise between kind of free behavior and what's easy to analyze, um, right? So we, we kind of think about, you know, what we, we have ethologists in our lab who think about what, what is good animal behavior, what is naturalistic animal behavior. We have engineers who are good at kind of lighting systems, um, and we have machine learning people who are thinking about the types of algorithms that, um, and the types of data that we can analyze. Um, and we also try to develop um, usable software, um, so biologists usable software, um, and we spend a lot of our time on the user interface and we're very into kind of active learning approaches that um, uh, where the, the human is, is simultaneously labeling data while the uh, machine learning is trying to learn structure in it and they kind of interact. Um, Yes, and we, we only kind of work on um, really usable working solutions. So um, because we have neuroscientists in my lab and we collaborate with neuroscientists, the software we develop is all being used for actual experiments. And so it's, um, we, we really want to, to make it usable. Um, and one of the things that I find um, very fun about kind of working in, in biology is that, um, uh, you know, in, in kind of, uh, you know, canned computer science, computer vision data sets, um, it's very difficult to figure out if your um, unsupervised learning algorithms are working or not. Um, and in, you know, biology um, environments, you can um, come up with 
different unsupervised or non-traditional learning frameworks, and you can do follow-up experiments based on the hypotheses that you develop from, from those analyses um, to kind of see if the, the unsupervised analyses you're coming up with are actually worthwhile. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is um, uh, a large project that I've been doing for, I think, about, about the past six years. Um, we're getting close to publishing, hopefully. Um, trying to um, identify the neural substrates of a variety of different behaviors in the fruit fly. Um, so we're looking at a bunch of different um, locomotion behaviors like walking and jumping and uh, backing up, as well as um, social behaviors um, like chasing. Um, and uh, we wanna find which parts of the brain um, are involved in producing those behaviors kind of at the level of, of single neuron resolution. Um, and so we're using this, um, this collection of, of uh, GAL4 driver lines that I mentioned earlier, um, where we have, um, we have about 2,000 of these different um, GAL4 lines that we've looked at where we can target um, expression to different subsets of neurons. Um, and we are um, looking for the behavioral effects of activating these neurons. So instead of, um, so in these images here, you can see we're targeting GFP there so that we can see which neurons we're, we're affecting. Um, and in our behavior experiments, we're targeting TRIP, which is a, um, a heat-based effector, so that when we bring the flies up to 30 degrees Celsius, the neurons are activated, and we can look at the behavioral effects of that activation. Um, so I've shown a couple of videos of what um, control, our genetic control fruit flies look like. So they kind of walk around in the dish. They're somewhat interested in each other, but not terribly interested in each other. They spend about half of their time walking and half of their time stopped in the kind of conditions that we've um, come up with. Um, and then we want to look at the behavioral effects for each of these different two th of these uh, 2,000 different genotypes um, of this activation. And we see a variety of different types of effects. Um, so we see um, at the top, you see um, increased courtship. So when flies court, they, one of the kind of sure signs of it is, is uh, the male fly chasing the, um, the other flies. Um, we see, um, what's that? Um, we see um, a lot of increased jumping in certain lines, and we see female aggression in other lines. So we see a wide variety of pretty extreme phenotypes um, in this um, data set. And so the way that we're gonna try to make sense of this data, so each of these um, different GAL4 lines has expression not in a single cell type, but in maybe on the order of 30 different cell types, but we would like to know kind of which specific type of neuron is actually causing this behavior. So what we can do is we can take a particular behavior effect, like all of the um, lines that jump more than control, and we can look at the expression patterns for those lines. And so these are the six lines that jump the most in our, out of our 2200 lines that we've screened. Um, and we can look for commonalities in the expression pattern. Um, and so in these lines, um, all of the, um, they all have expression in these C-shaped neurons that you see here. Um, and those are um, visual output neurons. So they're um, uh, parts that are going from the optic lobes to the central brain. Mm -hmm. It, there is not, yeah. Yeah, we don't have a, nope. So I will get to that, yeah. Um, so right now we're doing everything by this looks like this. Um, yeah, so um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we get kind of a hypothesis that it's you know this part of this region of the brain and then we can kind of go in and our, our anatomy experts go and look at this part of the brain and figure out, okay, there are these actual cell types and people have for these um, lobular columnar neurons figured out kind of the, the, the you know, 10 different types of these or 20 different types of these that there are uh, by looking at structure. Um, yeah, so why do we wanna know um, you know, the regions of the brain that are involved in producing a behavior. Um, so we want to get at um, um, kind of in this kind of systems neuroscience type of approach, we really want to have kind of a circuit level understanding of how behaviors are produced. Um, and so this is, you know, identifying the parts of the brain, the, neuro, the, the neuronal cell types that are involved in producing a behavior is just kind of the start of our experiments. Um, so once you know which parts of the brain are involved in the behavior, you can use um, more sophisticated techniques to try to record the neural activity, for example. Um, so um, an experiment that was done um, by Vivek Giaramon's lab at Janilia, um, they had initially, do, through a screen, determined that um, this part of the brain, the central complex of the brain, and the, in particular the ellipsoid body, were involved in kind of um, visual place learning and walking behaviors. Um, and so they did some calcium imaging in those parts, in that particular part of the brain. So they had kind of specific driver lines that would allow them to get kind of sparse expression of calcium signals in that part of the brain. And so this is one of these closed loop experiments of a fly walking on a ball. Um, and then <clears throat> 
doing calcium imaging in that part of the brain. And <coughs> sorry. what they found um, is that this, this, um, this circular ellipsoid body of the, of the fly is actually kind of a compass that um, uh, represents the head direction or the direction that the, that the fly is facing in the environment. And the pretty interesting thing, you know, it's not just a visual behavior, like that you see the, the um, top panel there is showing kind of what the, what the fly is seeing. It's not just that it's representing kind of a visual um, uh, uh, representation of where it is in the environment. When they actually turn off the lights and the fly continues to walk around, it's this part of the brain, it's this kind of compass of the brain shows, uh, continues to show the direction of the, of the um, fly. So, so you can kind of find this nice, um, you know, circular compass in the fly brain. So that's the type of study that we're trying to kind of um, support by trying to find just the parts of the brain that are, that are interesting for a given behavior. Okay, so um, why do we work on the fly? Um, so the, the fly is a relatively new um, uh, organism for, for, in particular, kind of circuit level neuroscience. Um, but uh, um, the things I think that are good about it is it's good compromise between kind of simplicity and complexity. So it does a variety of complex behaviors, but it has more on the order of 100,000 neurons as opposed to you know, the, the millions and billions that you have in, in, in rodents or mammals. Um, the, the other reason that we do this is the kind of tools and resources that are available. So we have great genetic tools for um, the fruit fly um, that allow us to kind of get this kind of single cell level resolution um, targeting of expression and control of the activity. Um, and so this is an example um, from uh, the Rubin lab at Genelia where they've made single cell type um, GAL4 lines for every single type of um, neuron in the mushroom body, which is the part of the fly brain that's involved in learning. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, they're trying to develop this entire connectome of the fly brain, so you would have kind of the structural connectivity um, of the entire um, brain to try to put together with these um, types of analyses. So that's why we work on the fly. Um, and so I'm going to talk about um, this one experiment that, that we've been working on, um, where we're taking um, these uh, video data of the behavioral effects of the, of the neural activation and um, these um, images of the expression patterns of which neurons were actually um, activating. Um, and we are doing kind of quantitative computer vision based analysis of the behavior, um, quantitative analysis kind of clustering methods to try to find the, um, the structure of the brain, and then putting together those two types of analyses um, to try to find the regions of the brain that are involved in a variety of behaviors. Okay, so um, I spent most of the, the work on the, um, the behavior analysis side of things. Um, so we were screening through 2,200 of these different GAL4 lines. We collected um, 20,000 videos as part of this. Um, each of them is you know, 15 minutes long and it ended up being a 500 terabyte data set. We went through 400,000 flies. It's too much data to kind of analyze manually, so we use computer vision techniques for that. Um, and we started with tracking the flies. So when I was a postdoc at Caltech, I developed a program for tracking the body position of multiple flies. And so we're fitting um, ellipses to the body of each fly, um, which I am showing with uh, triangles here. Um, the triangles kind of indicate the, the direction of the, of the head. Um, and so that's kind of the basic um, type of data that we're, we're starting with. We can also um, track the wings using kind of simple image processing techniques, and we can identify the sex of the fly. So we put 10 male flies and 10 female flies in. Female flies are slightly bigger than male flies. So um, after we track the flies, um, we use um, uh, a system we called, uh, uh, we, we developed called Java to um, use machine learning to categorize the behavior of each fly in each frame. So that's what um, I'm showing here for um, the one fly with the triangle on it. I'm showing at every single frame the different behaviors that are automatically classified that the fly is performing. Um, and so there are a variety of locomotion behaviors like walking and stopping and uh, social behaviors like um, chasing, uh, wing extension, um, things like that. These are, uh, these are, it's a supervised learning algorithm. Yeah, so, um, so we use a supervised machine learning algorithm. Uh, for the few who don't know what uh, supervised machine learning is, um, the idea is we manually label whether the animal is or is not performing the behavior in a small set of frames. Um, and then we train a classifier. So, so just for this example here, the, uh, the left two examples, I've labeled that the fly is performing wing extension, so that back fly has its wing out. And then on the right, I've labeled that the fly is not performing wing extension. 
Um, and we train a classifier that inputs information from the video, which is in the form of the trajectories that, we've, that come out of our, our tracking program, um, and outputs a prediction of whether the animal is or is not performing the behavior um, that best agrees with these manual labels. Um, and so if you have a, a function that can replicate a large enough subset of, uh, set of uh, manual labels, then you can hope that it will work well on uh, new videos. Um, and that's kind of where machine learning comes in. And we can apply this classifier to any new video to automatically classify the behavior. Um, so the program we developed um, is an interactive program. Um, so this is a screencast of uh, me training a wing grooming classifier. Um, and so wing grooming, um, what it looks like is that you kind of see the fly kind of tucking its wing underneath it um, in, this, in this video here. Um, and so um, I'm going to label a couple bouts where the fly is performing the behavior and where the fly is not performing the behavior. And so the top timeline um, shows in red um, frames that I've labeled as positive that the fly is grooming its wings and uh, um, blue shows that it's negative that the fly is not grooming its wings. Um, and then we've made the machine learning here um, fast enough, so both the feature computation and the um, learning algorithm uh, fast enough that you can kind of train the classifier uh, while you wait. So it takes on the order of 30 seconds to, to train the classifier. Um, and uh, um, you can, uh, the bottom timeline will show the predictions of the classifier. Um, one thing that, that we emphasize to our users to do is to only label the behaviors where they know what the behavior label should be. Um, so you can see in between kind of the end of that wing grooming, at, near the end of the wing grooming bout that I left a little gap where I didn't know exactly where wing grooming stopped. So one thing that we act, that, that kind of helps us is to not have uh, bad labels in our, in our learning data. So on the bottom, you can uh, scroll through the predictions of the classifier and then find frames where the classifier is currently predicting incorrectly. Um, but you know what the correct label is. So I think from those kind of two bouts of the behavior labels, it's learned that the fly should be sitting still, but it hasn't learned kind of that its wings need to be in a certain uh, position. Um, and so you can kind of go and correct the, um, the labels and then retrain and um, things work better. Um, so we've spent a lot of time on the um, interface here. Um, so not only can you label like a single video, you can label lots of videos. Um, you can, you know, there are a bunch of different ways of kind of finding interesting frames to label. Um, and uh, in particular, being able to um, try things on a bunch of different videos and, and include a bunch of different videos in our training data set was important when we wanted to get um, a single behavior classifier that would generalize to the, uh, the 2,000 different genotypes of flies that, that we want our classifier to work on. Um, so if you only train on kind of your genetic control, it's not your classifier might not work particularly well on flies that jump all of the time because it just hasn't seen that behavior before. Um, and the kind of basic assumption in machine learning is that the training data set and the test data set have the same distribution. Do the labels come from anecdotal observations? Are they from the invent a label distribution? Um, so, so they, so what we did to kind of come up with the different behaviors that we decided there were, um, so it was a combination of looking at the literature of kind of, for, so for courtship behavior has been studied quite a bit. Um, so at least for the male flies behavior, there are a bunch of different behaviors that people think they have seen in the past, like chasing wing extension, attempted copulation. Um, and then for locomotion, it's a little bit less clear what the kind of behavior divisions are. So we did that based on um, looking at the behaviors ourselves. But um, it was a fly biologist in my lab who, who came up with the, um, the labels. And there are things like walking, which you know, there, there are various types of walking that people have come up with, you know, tripod gait in particular. Um, but uh, some of them may or may not be exact behaviors. Um, so like crab walking is what we call walking sideways, and it might not be a very discrete behavior. Um, and so that's one of the issues that we're kind of working on is whether, you know, should we have a discrete representation of behavior or should it be continuous? And in particular, at this resolution, we're not able to see the legs of the flies reliably. So it's very hard, I think, to, to tell from this resolution whether it really is discrete motor patterns or not. Um, and so one of the things we're working on now, we have kind of recorded similar types of data at much higher resolution, and we're trying to track legs and things like that. What, what did you say the resolution of the, of the representation of flies was? Why are we uh, following the limits of that? So um, right now we have the ellipse, and then we have just the kind of angles of the wings that are fit, and then we have kind of the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's you know, just kind of the area of the, um, 
the, the wing that was fit, which is, may or may not be a useful feature. But um, we take that and we compute uh, from the, that kind of representation. Our, um, so uh, we're training, so we're doing a per frame classifier, but it's taking a window of data around the current frame. And so we compute a bunch of features from that window. Um, so we start by computing um, what I call, do I have slides for this? I don't remember. Yes. Uh, no. Okay, so we start by comput computing things like um, the velocity of the fly, um, the distance to the closest fly, kind of anything that, that I could think of that was behaviorally relevant. And then on top of that, we have a bunch of filters that we um, apply to the data. Again, anything that we could compute quickly, so like a, an a, 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 a box filter, an average of the window, the min, the max, kind of a bunch of different um, uh, features. Um, so it ends up being on the order of um, depending on which feature you decide to select uh, between 5,000 and 20,000 features to, to represent every frame. Okay, so um, yeah, so we do um, behavior classification. Um, so, um, so we have 15 different behaviors that we've um, trained behavior classifiers for. Um, and uh, my, my postdoc spent a lot of time kind of, um, you know, you train a classifier based on a, a few different gal lines. If we don't know what the variability in the behavior is to begin with, then we apply the um, classifier to the entire data set and then use various heuristics to try to find interesting lines to add to the training data set where we think the behavior classifier might not be working. So of course we look at lines where we have a lot of occurrences of the behavior detected. We also look at lines where we have kind of like two different behaviors occurring simultaneously that we don't think should occur simultaneously. So, for, so one example was um, we found one line um, where we had a co-occurrence of backing up and jumping, and it turned out that that line tended to jump backwards a lot, and our classifier had just never seen flies jumping backwards, and it kind of generalized that if you're, you know, no matter how fast you're going, if you're going backwards, you should be, that's called, you know, backing up. And so it learned kind of that there is a thing called jumping backwards from, from that different Galfoy line. Um, okay, so we do behavior classification. We also have these per frame features like the speed of the, of the fly. Um, and then um, to represent um, each um, genotype of flies, um, we just kind of do the simplest thing you can think of. We just um, average over frames. Um, so we can compute things for the um, entire, um, the, the entire uh, genotype, um, like the average fraction of time that the fly spends chasing. Uh, we also have things based just on the trajectories, like the average speed of the flies, and then we can combine these things and we can look at things like the average speed while walking. Um, and so these are, um, we compute um, about 200 of these different behavior statistics. Um, these are 20 of the most interpretable ones um, for one particular gal line. And um, this gal line, oops, um, has, um, high occurrences of, um, okay, sorry, the, uh, the x-axis here are the different behaviors. The y-axis is how different from control this behavior statistic is. So zero means that it's um, the, at the same value as the average for our control. Positive numbers, so it's in terms of standard deviations of control. Positive means it does the behavior, has a higher value for the behavior statistic, and negative values means it has a lower value. Um, and so this, um, this particular line has high values for um, uh, in particular wing flick and some of these social behaviors like touching and chasing. So this is a very social line of flies that does a lot of um, courtship behaviors. Um, so this is a summary of our um, kind of the 500 terabytes of video into one matrix. Um, so each different column here is a different gal four line. There are 2,200 of these um, columns. And then each row is a different behavior statistic that we're computing. Um, and red means that that line has a higher value than control for the behavior statistic, and bl blue means it has a lower value. Um, just to kind of um, orient you, um, this group of flies here, or this group of lines here, all have very high values for some of the social behavior statistics like chasing and touching. Um, and so there are um, a lot of kind of these um, increased social activity lines. And then um, this, this group of lines here all um, have very um, increased amounts of time spent stopping. And um, you can see, so that's what uh, this, this uh, row here is an increased amount of time spent stopping. And you, these behaviors here, because some of our behaviors are mutually exclusive, you can't be both stopped and walking at the same time. So necessarily, if you spend a lot more time stopped, you're also gonna spend a lot less time walking. And one of the difficulties in interpreting this data set is kind of these correlations between different behaviors or behavior statistics. Okay, so the first step um, 
was to quantify the behavior, and now we want to be able to relate this to the, um, the uh, light microscopy images that we've, we've taken of the expression patterns. And if you recall, what we want to be able to do is take one particular behavior phenotype, look for um, lines that have high values for, for this, and then find the parts of the brain that are um, kind of common, um, uh, have co commonly have expression in, in, in those lines. Okay, so um, as I said before, we have these, um, these uh, image stacks um, of the expression patterns. Um, there's, that, that's basically all that we have. We don't have kind of a, um, a we, we, we would ideally want to have kind of for each of these different um, GAL4 lines, we would want to have a list of what cell types have expression in each of these lines. Um, but uh, we, as we, was we were talking about before, we don't actually have an enumeration of the different types of cells um, in the fly brain, so we, we don't have that type of data. We just have images, and we needed to use kind of computer vision techniques to, to try to approximate something like this. Um, and so what we did is we um, automatically clustered the fly brain based on the genetic expression patterns. And so the idea that we're um, using to, um, to do our clustering um, is that if you take a pair of voxels, if they both either have expression or both don't have expression, they're probably part of the same neuronal cell type or functional unit. Whereas if you take a pair of uh, voxels that um, sometimes both have expression, sometimes both don't have expression, but on occasion um, one has expression and the other one does not, those might actually be parts of different um, cell types or different functional units. Um, and so we're using kind of the distance according to our um, collection of, of expression patterns to cluster the fly brain. Um, and we use kind of a very basic, um, uh, we use the furthest first algorithm for clustering. Um, and so this is the result of um, clustering the fly brain into about 7,000, uh, we call them super voxels. Um, and uh, the, you know, so, so the structure of the fly brain is not totally known, but some parts of the brain have been, have been um, looked at in, in more detail. And we do see kind of some of the um, characteristics that people have seen in the fly brain in the past showing up in our clustering. So we see in the ellipsoid body, we see kind of rings coming out in our clustering. In the optic lobes on the, um, the visual system, we, we see kind of layers. Um, the fan-shaped body, we see layers as well. So there are kind of uh, things, the things that are known about the structure of the brain um, repeat well in our clustering. Um, and then for the parts of the brain that people haven't done a lot of investigation of, we have some kind of representation that is hopefully uh, a useful one. Okay, so how do we use this, um, this clustering? We um, take our 30 million voxel representation and we're going to convert it to this 7,000 dimensional representation. Go ahead. Across, so it's the clustering is done um, across a ton of animals, right? So it's it's across the different genotypes. Um, so and each of our images per genotype is actually an average of multiple. Um, so that the fly in particular has very stereotyped um, brains um, compared to you know more complex animals like mice. Um, but yes, I, I would say that most of the variability or the kind of um, the 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 problems with our method are due to um, registration problems. So these all have to be registered um, automatically into the same coordinate system, um, and that's not perfect. Sorry, were these different um, GAL4 lines in different types, but it was not functional in each? Nope, nope. They're, yeah, they're all just different GAL4 lines. Yeah. Okay, so for each of these super voxels, we can take the average expression within that super voxel as the representation of that region of the brain. And so we convert our 30 million voxel representation to a 7,000 dimensional representation. Um, and so this is what the, um, the data set looks like for our super voxel um, in anatomy representation. So again, each of the different columns is a, a GAL4 line, and then each of the rows is a different super voxel. And uh, what we want to do is find common commonalities between the behavior data set that we've collected and this anatomy data set that we've collected. Okay, and um, we're going to do that in the uh, simplest possible way. We're going to take one behavior statistic and we're going to take one super voxel and we're going to look at the correlations um, across GAL4 lines there. Um, so on the x-axis here, I'm plotting the expression in um, the selected super voxel. On the y-axis, I'm plotting the um, increase in the amount of time spent walking. 
Um, and uh, you can see that this is a pretty noisy plot. So each dot here corresponds to one of our 2200 GAL4 lines. Um, and uh, um, there are, there, while there are lines that have expression that don't have the behavior, and there are lines that have the behavior that don't um, have expression, we have a highly statistically significant correlation here. Um, and uh, you know, we expected this data set to be noisy. You can, there are multiple parts of the brain that you can excite, which will cause the fly to walk. So you, ima you can imagine that you will have walking without having expression in this particular part of the brain. Also, our, the kind of effect, you, know, you can have masking effects where if you excite this part of the brain, but you also excite, sorry, this other part of the brain, you might not see, you know, if you excite the walking part of the brain and the stopped part of the brain, maybe the stopped part of the brain will override the walking part of the brain. So you expect to also see um, part, uh, kind of lines where you have expression, but you don't have the behavior. Um, but kind of by doing this with enough of these different GAL4 lines, um, we're able to kind of um, use large amounts of data to find these statistical correlations. Um, so we did a um, significance test for, for correlation um, between um, each pair of behavior statistics and, and supervoxios. And then for a given behavior, um, we can map back to the regions of the brain that the supervoxel corresponds to. So this is a, a, a map show, uh, where we're coloring the supervoxel based on the, the p-value of the um, significance of this correlation. Um, and we can start to see kind of parts of the brain that seem to, to um, make some sense. So in particular here, this is um, the map of the parts of the brain that are correlated with increased walking. Um, and you see um, this ellipsoid body structure coming up um, and the optic lobes. Um, and we can further cluster um, this, this uh, map of, of, uh, of the, the, wa the increased walking map into three different components, so the optic lobe, um, the optic tubercle, and the ellipsoid body, which is kind of a putative circuit um, where you have kind of information coming from the optic lobe going through the optic tubercle to the um, central complex in the ellipsoid body. Um, and so one of the things that's nice about this is that that's not the kind of end of, of your study. You actually have, for each of these um, different regions of the brain, you can find GAL4 lines that target those regions and have express, ha and um, have the behavioral effect that you're looking for. So you can kind of get direct genetic access to those parts of the brain. Uh, we can use more genetic techniques where we um, uh, find intersections between, genetically find intersections between those parts of the, um, the between any pair of GAL4 lines, so you can create these split GAL4 lines, um, and uh, look, test these, which have much sparser expression, so this is um, the expression for, for 15 of the, or 20 of these different lines that we created, and you can test whether um, those different split lines have the behavioral effect that, that you observed before, and a large fraction of them do. Um, and uh, we have a lot of these different behavior maps. Um, so um, we've both recapitulated known um, structural structure function relationships and found new ones. So um, courtship is a, a well-studied behavior in, in flies. Um, the fruitless um, circuit has, has been um, associated with courtship um, for a long time. Um, and our um, parts of the brain that seem to be associated, or that are correlated with wing extension, um, look a lot like the fruitless expression pattern. Um, then kind of a novel thing that we've discovered is uh, looking at female chasing, which we hypothesis is a female aggression behavior. Um, and in general, female behaviors haven't been looked at too much in fruit flies because they're a lot less um, uh, uh, obvious than, than male behaviors. Um, but we find kind of a, a very sparse part of, uh, sparse expression, or sorry, a sparse map of the parts of the brain that are correlated with uh, female chasing. Um, we have a few different locomotion behaviors. Um, so the jumping behavior, and the backing up behavior have these um, uh, visual output neurons that we're, we're um, associating. Um, wing grooming, we find a part of the um, AMMC, which is pretty unexpected, um, and we're still trying to figure out if that's real or not. Um, and then um, part of the um, uh, SOG, the subesophageal ganglion, that uh, seems to be involved in uh, control of the wing angle. So we have a lot of these different maps. We have 200 different behavior statistics that we're computing. And not only do you want to look at kind of a single behavior statistic, but you might want to look at combinations of behavior statistics. So for instance, our female chasing map is actually uh, lines that have an increase in female chasing, but not an increase in male chasing. So you want to maybe look at logical combinations of this. Um, so we've created um, this GUI um, for allowing biologists to create um, these maps on the fly. So you can kind of choose 
a single behavior statistic or you can choose combinations of behavior statistics and investigate those maps. Um, so these are maps in 3D, so you might want to um, uh, uh, look at them as slices, so you can look at di different slices. You can do kind of all of the different types of analyses that we did on this data, so you can find for a given correlated region, you can find the GAL4 lines that are most responsible for that and look at kind of the raw data for those GAL4 lines. Um, so we've uh, kind of been working on a GUI for trying to make any, all of the analyses that we've done something that other biologists can do. Um, the other thing we've done is um, put our data on the web um, and try to make it searchable. Um, so for each of our GAL4 lines and for each behavior statistic, you can find the GAL4 lines sorted by um, uh, the, uh, the amount of time, the, the, the value of that behavior statistic. We have access to kind of the rawest forms of the data and, and more processed forms of the data um, for each of those GAL4 lines. We learned that you can upload an unlimited number of videos to YouTube. So there are now 20,000 videos of flies walking around in a dish on YouTube. Um, you're welcome to watch them. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can kind of get kind of a, a, um, a, you know, a sense of the rawest forms of the data because it's you know, very processed and, and uh, it's good to be able to kind of look at the raw forms to see what, what the actual data that's causing, that that's creating the effects you're seeing are. Okay, so a summary of this part. Um, so we use machine version and learning tools for automated analysis of behavior. Um, and we use these tools to analyze data from a large scale neural activation screen. Um, we generated hypotheses of the parts of the brain involved in a wide variety of behaviors using this. Okay, so what our lab is working on now, so that's mostly done, we're just kind of trying to write up the paper now. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, um, uh, we feel like you know, we, you know, we're looking at just the body position of the animal doesn't give us the resolution that we actually want. The kind of neural tools that we have now are much high, are, are very high resolution. We can you know, activate single cell types. Um, we can record with single or subcellular resolution the neural activity. Um, and we really need our behavior resolution to, to be of a similar scale. Um, and so one of the things that we've been working on is um, tracking parts of animals, um, which I think is kind of something that computer vision approaches are, are ready to solve. Um, so one of the um, types of data that we've been working with for a while now is um, uh, it's, a, it's a head fixed mouse where they're doing neural recordings as well as optogenetics um, in the mouse. Um, and they want to look at this kind of reaching behavior um, and look at kind of the, um, the planning and the error correction in that behavior. So this is a, they've broken up the behavior into kind of the lift, the hand open, grab, uh, uh, supinate, and bringing the, 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 um, the, the uh, food pellet to the mouth. And we're trying to kind of figure out kind of the, the relationship between the neural activity and the motor cortex and this behavior. Um, that's a relatively easy tracking problem. Um, the, uh, the other type of tracking problem people are very interested in is, um, again, these kind of head-fixed animals, in particular head-fixed flies. So this is tracking um, five points on the face of the fly, so two points on the antennae, and then one point above the proboscis. Um, and uh, we're trying both, so both of these are, the outputs I'm showing here are using something called cascaded pose regression, which is a random fern-based regressor. Um, we're also doing the kind of standard deep learning approaches to this and, and uh, seeing what works better. Um, the um, cascaded pose regression has the advantage of being fast, so we can kind of put it into another one of these interactive frameworks where you label data um, and train while you wait. Um, the deep learning is much slower and takes a day to train, so we're you know, looking at the positives and benefits of, or the positives and negatives of each of those approaches. Um, and then the other type of um, problem that we're, we're spending a lot of our, our effort on is, um, so I mentioned that kind of figuring out um, the behavior, the behavior representation is a, is a hard problem that we don't know the, the answer to. And um, there are approaches that are fully supervised like Java where we've manually labeled that these are the behaviors that you want to, to classify and then please repeat that for me um, in an automatic way. Um, and then there are unsupervised approaches where you do things like clustering. You say, this is what it means for two behaviors to be the same. Try and find um, a kind of a uh, way of breaking up the, um, the videos that we see so that similar behaviors are together. Um, and uh, in between there, there's a lot of um, you know, interesting ways that we can look at the data. Um, and so we're very interested in these weekly supervised approaches to learning. Um, one of the um, types of approaches we've been uh, doing is um, triplet-based, where instead of saying that this is behavior one and this is behavior two, um, 
we say that behavior uh, A is, co is more similar to behavior B than it is to behavior C. Um, and then you try to kind of uh, find a, a, a representation of the behavior data that conforms to those, um, those rules. So where do we get these um, triplets from? Okay, sorry, this is an example of, of a triplet here. So this is a pair of mice uh, interacting. Um, and so, um, so which behave, which, which uh, do you think that this center clip is more similar to the one on the left or the one on the right? Yeah, so, so we may not be able to kind of give a name to this behavior, but I, I think that the one on the right, both the one in the middle and the one on the right are kind of more, um, the, the, the female is kind of less accepting of the male mouse. Um, sorry, the female mouse is the one with the vertical stripes and the male mouse is the one with the horizontal stripes. Um, so we might be able to kind of get a human who can say that um, the, the right video clip is more similar to the middle one than the left one is. Um, the other place that we can try to get triplets um, are uh, kind of more creative and unbiased sources. Um, so we're very interested in multimodal learning right now. Um, so one place that we can get another mode of um, data is the, you know, we have video recordings of the animals, but um, we also have ultrasonic um, audio recordings of the animals, and we can try to use that as an annotation of the behavior. Um, we're also working on using uh, neural recording uh, of a behaving animal as the annotation. Um, so um, one thing that we can do with this, for instance, and this was just kind of a proof of principle for us to start with, um, occasionally mice will make audible vocalizations. Most of the time it's in the ultrasonic range, um, but we use this um, whether a behavior was near an, ultra, uh, an audible vocalization or not as, a, as, our, as our label. Um, and we said, our, our, our hypothesis was that if two behaviors were near an audible vocalization, they would be more similar to each other than one behavior near an audible vocalization and one behavior not near an audible vocalization. Um, and so we used metric learning um, to um, find a distance, distance metric that satisfies um, this, these types of triplet comparisons. And then we used uh, T-SNE to project this um, new metric into the data in this new metric space um, for visualization. Um, so that's uh, what this is showing. Each data point here is a different um, behavior clip. Um, and so this is the 2D embedding without doing any learning. Um, and um, as you can see here, so I'm plotting as density the, um, uh, the behavior bouts that are near vocalization and behavior bouts that are uh, not near vocalization. Um, and you can see that they're kind of mixed up in our initial um, representation. Um, but after we do uh, learning, um, so metric learning, after we do metric learning, we get this representation on the right. Um, and you can see that it separates um, the vocalizations from the not vocalizations, which is what we told it to do. So that's, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, making sure that the algorithm is working correctly. But did it actually help us find any structure in the behavior? Um, so how do we tell if this worked? And, and if it worked, what did it do? And, how, and what did we learn from this? Um, so we made this uh, tool for trying to visualize um, what the learned structure is. Um, and so um, you can take this kind of TSNE projection of the data um, and you can um, you know, hover over it with your mouse um, and uh, look at kind of what the raw behavior, um, so you can, um, you can um, color the, let's see, you can color the points by various behavior statistics that you think are interesting, like the distance between the, um, the mice um, you can hover over parts of the, of the um, embedding and look at both the vocalization space as well as the behavior representation to try to understand what the commonalities in the structure are there. Um, kind of everything we could, you know, it was, you know we, were, we were working with biologists to, you know, figure out what they want to know and then trying to make that very easy to do um, uh, quickly so that you can kind of look at a lot of data. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to finish, um, so Alice Roby is the postdoc who worked on the, um, the fly neural activation screen. Uh, Nakul Verma is the one working on the, uh, the, the uh, metric learning types of approaches, and um, uh, Mike Cabra and Alan Lee are the ones working on the part-based tracking. All right, thank you. And I, I just want to give one plug. So Janelia is looking for new group leaders, um, and they are 
um, moving toward hiring fairly young group leaders, so in particular people straight out of their PhD. So if you're interested in starting your own small lab at Chenilia, contact me. Uh, so you, yeah, it's all internally funded, um, so you ask for what you want. Yes, yeah, so we, we, so, so we have images of the VNC in particular, and, and you, would, you would definitely want to analyze that part of, um, you know, the, the correlations between behavior and that part of the, of the nervous system as well. Um, the registration, there is no registration algorithm at this point, so it would just be kind of, and there, people have developed ones, we just kind of have to make them really work. And so I think that kind of the types of approaches we've done would allow us to apply that to, to the VNC as well. But uh, um, yeah, we just kind of haven't done that yet just because it's a lot more kind of image processing work. Yeah, so at Chenilia, there's a, a few people who have made single cell type resolution um, lines for the descending neurons. Um, and then there's a group now that's working on single cell types for the VNC in particular. So I think, you know, that they, they get very specific effects. You know, there's, I mean, there's still a lot of interpretation that has to be done with kind of your activating just this one cell type artificially and what does that mean? Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think definitely you would find um, interesting things there. And I, and I think that's another place where we would really wanna have um, finer readouts of the behavior as well, um, not, you know, looking at, you know, individual leg movements, for example. So we haven't exactly done that, right? So our, our, our screen was just a 15 minute screen. So, um, the way that people currently detect sleep in a fly is, did it sit still for five minutes? Um, we did um, find, you know, so, so we approximated sleep in our thing because we, we don't want to wait for five minutes to tell if the fly is asleep because then we would have like three data points in our 15 minute experiment. Um, uh, so we approximated that as stopping and not grooming your wings based on the resolution that we had there. And so we made a map for that which showed uh, some part of the brain um, that seems to correlate with what people have found for being involved in sleep. There, there are lots of people who also look specifically at sleep in flies. I mean, that's very common to, to look at. So I think these lines have been put through the, uh, do you know the trikinetics assay? It's a thing with, a, you put one fly in a little vial and you look at laser beam crossings um, and you do that for a week. Um, and so people have, have done that and found parts of the brain that seem to be, or I, I think nobody's really done the kind of part of the, you know, corresponding the anatomy and the behavior, kind of the way we have in the past, they've kind of found hits in their screen and then tried to kind of further analyze those hits. So do you know how much uh, the rat actually has uh, a reaction to the Do you know how much they're thinking? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, I mean, so, so, um, so yeah, it's going to depend on the animal, right? But the uh, flies, you know, are, have very good visual systems. Um, one thing that I'm very interested in with the flies is that they um, they are always touching each other, actually, and I think that's a behavior that hasn't been studied too much. So they can taste with their feet, um, and um, they're constantly touching other flies when they walk by them. And I would love to know what the purpose of that behavior is, what they're learning from that, kind of what what that phenotype is. Um, the mice. Um, Lots of people study the visual system in the mouse. It's not very good, in particular in the lab mice. They're semi-blind. Um, people uh, at Genelia look at whisking in mice in particular. Both flies and mice have great olfactory systems, but it's much harder to tell what they're sensing there and to control the stimuli that you give them. Uh, they can also both hear very well, yeah. 